Hey guys, in this video we're going to talk about um, blood sugar terminology. There are several people recently that mentioned, um, I don't really understand the terms that you're throwing out there and so I'm really confused so would you just back up and explain these terms and I agree with them that we need to have a video to make it really simple. So this video is for those people. Uh, number one, the word glycemic means relating to glucose or sugar, okay? And um, when we're talking about glycemic index, we're talking about a scale from high to low of the measurement of how fast the body digests and absorbs and raises the sugar in the blood. Okay, So right here, if we ate jelly beans, for example, it's going to spike up and that would be very high on the list. If you ate celery, okay, it's not very sweet, it's going to be very low. All right, so that's what glycemic index means, how fast uh, you can spike your sugars. All right? Now, what happens when you do spike your sugars, you have a hormone that comes in there called insulin. And insulin is basically going to, it does, has one really main purpose is to drop the sugar. It does not want the sugar too high, so as soon as you spike it, it's going to come in there and remove it from the blood. So insulin is a hormone that removes the sugar, it lowers the sugar. Okay? Now the next term we're going to talk about is glycemic load. Okay? So that would be a combination of the glycemic index and the carb carbohydrate content. Okay? What does that mean, carbohydrate content? Well, if something was very high, on, and this is another scale too, okay? if something was very high on the glycemic load, it would create a long duration of this spiked blood sugar. Okay? If something was low on the list, it would create a little spike and then come right down really fast. So it's kind of like the duration, okay? the quantity of how much carb and how much effect that it's creating. It's, like, it's really like the true glycemic response because let's say, for example, you eat carrots that are high in carbohydrate. Well, they're so also high in fiber, so they're going to have a low glycemic load. Okay? But a baked potato, <laughs> um, that's going to very, have a very high glycemic load because it's going to create a, a longer duration than something else with fiber. So that's another term, and so we want to look at both of these terms when we're measuring things because there's some subtle differences. All right. Now let's talk about the insulin index. What is that? That's another scale of how much insulin the body is going to release. Now the difference between glycemic index and insulin index is the glycemic index measures the blood sugar spike. The insulin index measures the insulin spike, okay? Completely different situation. And so you could have um, non-carbohydrate things that can spike insulin. You, mostly it's carbohydrate that will increase insulin, but you can have other things that can trigger insulin too. So the insulin index are the, usually the, um, it goes beyond just the carbohydrates, okay? So you have protein, for example, that can spike uh, insulin. Now it's interesting, if you have um, low-fat protein, like some type of fat-free dairy, for example, that gives more insulin spike than if you had a fattier protein, like a fattier dairy, like brie cheese, for example. That would give a lower response, okay? So that's interesting because most people go for the low-fat. So the insulin index is a, a really good thing to look at and measuring um, your insulin because the whole goal is to keep the insulin low as possible to normal so you can lose weight and get healthy. The higher the insulin, the more damage to the body, okay? the more you're going to get diabetes. Okay? So that's what that's all about. Um, then we have carbohydrates, proteins, and fats. These are called macronutrients. Okay? So carbohydrates are going to be the thing that's going to spike this and of course this. All right, that would be a, a, at the top of the list. You're going to have all the refined sugars, high fructose corn syrup, and the refined grains and corns and things like that, and starches. It's going to raise it. But protein is a little different. Protein have, has the capacity to raise insulin uh, if it's in an excess amount. Okay, so the main reason we need protein in the diet is to provide uh, structural material for the body parts. So the hair, the nails, the collagen, the bone all need 
and the muscle all need protein, so we need these to build up our structure. When you consume excessive protein, it will increase insulin, okay? So what does that mean? Well, anything more than 35 grams per meal of protein can be converted into uh, sugar, okay, or glucose. Um, now this all depends too on your age and your metabolism and all that, but generally speaking this is a rough number. So and this is re related to about three to six ounces of protein per meal. That's what I'm going to recommend for you just to be safe. I mean a little bit more is okay, a little less is okay, but right around this range here just to make sure that protein doesn't stimulate insulin. Okay? So, but typically if you have a, a moderate amount of protein, you're not going to raise insulin too much, okay? Then we have this thing called fat. This is what people are avoiding. And what's interesting is that fat has near zero response of insulin, okay? So it doesn't, uh, it doesn't have that response like carbohydrates. So, so really when, when you talk about ketosis or a ketogenic diet, we're talking about a diet that is very low in carbs, moderate protein, and higher in fat. Why? Because the whole purpose of the ketosis is to um, run your body in an alternative fuel source. When you go into a state of ketosis, you're, you're no longer using glucose for your fuel. You're using ketones, which is a byproduct of fat. And the way you get into ketosis is by reducing your carbs down to 20 to 50 grams per day. So you gotta lower the carbs. Now the body is forced to use another fuel system, which is ketones, so it's gonna start burning your fat or the dietary fat that you're eating. And this is gonna give you another fuel source right here, um, which is ketones. And it's a much cleaner fuel source, it's better, there's a lot of other health benefits, you're gonna lose your belly, cognitive function, there's a lot of great things that are gonna happen, okay? So we have that term. Next term we're talking about is insulin sensitivity. So um, you have, you know, this huge population and each person could be rated by their sensitivity to insulin. So the higher sensitivity, that means the more the insulin is working in the body, the better the control of blood sugars. So the people that have high sensitivity to insulin um, and it's working don't have a weight problem. They're thin and they're usually healthy. I mean, maybe for other things they're not, but typically yes. So then we have the opposite scale, which is resistance. So if insulin is uh, no longer sensitive and it's resistant, it's not working, it's dysfunctional, uh, we have the condition called insulin resistance, okay? And what happens with that uh, condition is that the body no longer absorbs insulin like it should, so it blocks it, the cells block it. When that happens, it causes a feedback loop uh, overcompensation where your body's gonna make more insulin, the pancreas is gonna make more insulin, and it's gonna come in there um, to try to compensate. So now we have a situation, insulin resistance, where we have a lot higher amounts of insulin, like five to seven times versus a normal person. So these people are gonna be fat, okay? Two thirds of the population have this problem. They don't even know it, okay? So we have too much insulin, and uh, there's a lot of issues that come with that, which I'm not gonna get into. So here you have insulin resistance, right? And then over time, it gets worse, 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 until now the body is gonna to fail to compensate. It's no longer gonna, gonna compensate and adapt to the insulin resistance. So now it's shutting down. Now you're gonna get a condition called diabetes. So really diabetes is failure to adapt to the insulin resistance, which is the pre-diabetes, okay? So it's kinda of like it gets worse, 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 and then all of a sudden you, now you can't control your blood sugars because if you think about it, uh, insulin resistance is a spike in insulin, right? So that should normally keep your blood sugars low. But when it starts going higher, higher and higher in the blood, then that means it's no longer compensating, it's out of control, now you're a diabetic, okay? So, and then the way to fix insulin resistance is obviously to go back here and cut out the carbohydrates, okay? Get into a ketogenic diet. Uh, apple cider vinegar actually makes insulin more sensitive, so it's a really good thing to start consuming. Uh, as a remedy. Potassium is very, very important to consume from the vegetable source or electrolyte uh, powders. And then we have the B vitamins also can actually reduce the resistance. I like the nutritional yeast for that. And then we have exercise. Exercise also can make the um, insulin receptors more receptive 
and make insulin more sensitive. So that can also improve that. And then the, the, the most powerful thing is ins, uh, intermittent fasting. Okay? So that's another thing where you're, you're eating, but you're not eating as frequently and you're not snacking between the meals. And you want to give your body a chance to heal the insulin resistance because every time you eat, you spike insulin. So with ins intermittent fasting, what we're doing is just giving the body a, a break, a rest, so you can heal the situation. And so you can go from being a diabetes and reverse backwards to normal insulin, okay? So that's generally how you do it. And this is an overview of the blood sugar terms. Hey, if you haven't already subscribed, press the button below and I will keep you in the know. Hey, that rhymes.